I want to say thank you at first uh, for being here and thank you for making this movie that I simply can't even think about without like openly weeping. It is, it, it is just, it, it's a beautiful film and I'm so happy it's getting the, the, the recognition it deserves. Thank you so much for watching our film, Vinny. It's really one of my favorite films. It really reaches out to a lot of people and such a wide audience. It doesn't matter if they're hearing, deaf, or hard of hearing, or folks who speak English as a second language. It's just an extremely special film. Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and at this point, we're, we're about a week out from you winning the SAG. Uh, first deaf actor to win uh, Best actor. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering, because I don't get the chance to ask a lot of people this, what, what does it feel like physically, emotionally, to know that you made history? Is that something that's crossed your mind yet? Have you had a chance to sit with that yet? When I received the nomination, I told myself, wow, looking back on my journey, 30 years ago, I was extremely stubborn and extremely persistent. And all of the choices I made, really, I took a lot of risks. And my father used to call me a risk taker. And I really struggled. And I would take whatever job I could, no matter whether it was small or large. And so receiving these nominations, I feel like the choices I made and the tough struggle I went through really was worth it. And it was a payoff. And I felt a sense of relief that I'm okay. And, and I'm so glad that I've accomplished my dreams, really. And so it's such a blessing. And with the, I slept with the SAG Award with me in my bed that <laughs> night, and my wife was a bit jealous. You might have to make room. You might have to put the Oscar on the other side. Oscar, one night, SAG Award. It wasn't easy for me to carry two SAG Awards around that night because I need both my hands to sign. I need my hands to be free. Exactly. And so it was actually tough. I had one in one arm and I'd sign with one hand. And if I was hearing, I could just hold both of them and just use my voice and na, 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 blah, 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 blah. And so it was a really interesting experience for me that night. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned that stubbornness, uh, which, which has gotten you all the way here. Uh, I can't imagine that that was a, a an easy journey, a quick journey. And I'm wondering, you know, a lot of people listen to this podcast, they're actors just like you. And I'm wondering if if that stubbornness is 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 a kind of a requirement to be an actor of, 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 of any of any level. Well, I really I wanted to do it from my heart. I was following my instinct. And if I stopped acting there would have been something that really bothered me. I just wanted to keep going. And so my gut would get a little quieter, but of course, a lot of times I was worried because I was getting a bit older. I didn't have a retirement plan. I didn't have a, an idea of how I would support my family. My wife was beginning to get worried. My family members were worried. And they thought that it was really impossible for a deaf actor to get an opportunity in Hollywood. It's just like 1% of actors even, you know, it's almost like a hair in my beard, you know, it's just this one hair and that represented the opportunities that I was given. And so that's the way I felt. And so it really made an impact on me to make that change and to have that new perspective and to have that energy and a new perspective on me as an actor too. Absolutely. And and, and just in terms of, of, of CODA specifically, uh, for obvious reasons, I think something that this movie makes so obvious is how powerful silence is as both a filmmaking tool and an act and, and something in an actor's toolbox. And I'm wondering if that's if that's something that you know some actors don't realize. They 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 think that they should be emoting. They think that they should be at all times being the loudest possible filmmaker. I'm wondering how you see silence in an actor's toolbox. It's extremely important to listen to other actors and whatever lines they may have. So if I don't have any lines of dialogue, I have to react, I have to listen, and I have to emote. So when I'm silent and I don't have any lines of dialogue, really language is communicated through the eyes and emotion is communicated through the eyes and the audience can 
feel you. And if the audience is feeling the emotion that is coming through your eyes, and it's also the choices you make with your lines of dialogue, you don't just say your lines. It's really important to have the know what is between the lines. And then you're going to find the right emotion and the intent. And so I think you know what I mean. So I'm very glad that I trained quite a bit and I was a working theater actor. I did a lot of workshops. I did a lot of training over the, my 30 years of acting. And so I could understand how to analyze my characters. And even before my character says something and before my character has a line, but the, in between the lines is what's truly important. And I really love playing around with props as well, like a cigarette, for example. You can put the cigarette in your mouth and you can sign, or you can sign with one hand where you have a cigarette in the other, and just be natural. Just like when hearing people, they can talk with a cigarette in their mouth, or they can talk with a cup of coffee in their hand. And so as deaf actors, you can use your hands and use your props and be, make it natural, make it fun. And it's important for actors not just to say their lines, but to learn how to play around with the props, play around with the clothing. A clothing, of course, affects my characters too, and all of those things. And if I'm playing opposite another actor, the choices they make affect me. And I need to show that authenticity and just put that forward. And it doesn't matter if I'm in camera or not, or if I'm in picture or not. It's really important that you really feed your fellow actors that energy and those reactions. And so if I'm just like playing my lines, you know, or I'm just yawning because I'm not in this shot, I still need to feel the other actor and feed them with that energy. And that's what makes a great performance. You really have to work together as a team because we all cherish the story. That is our goal, is how to tell the story in the best way we can. Absolutely. And I mean, just especially with a movie like this, that's, you know, it's about breaking barriers down. I'm wondering on a macro level between you and a scene partner, when when you're trying to find that energy for the first time, when you're when you're trying to bounce ideas off each other and it's not quite clicking. How do you how do you get on that same wavelength? How do you make sure that you guys are sort of your streams are crossing, so to say? It's very important offset when the to make the actors feel comfortable with each other. Just tease each other and chat and build that trust before you get onto set. So sometimes I work with actors who really are so worried about memorizing their signed lines and I don't have the opportunity to really have a relationship with them. So when I'm working across with them, there's a disconnect and I have to play along depending on the individual. But really, you have to learn how to improv. You have to learn how to play around with your fellow actors and trust the choices they make. And that's what I do. And really all actors have different tools in their toolbox. And some are divas, some are really awkward. And it's really important to just work with people at all of these different levels. And it depends on the situation, it depends on the individual. And you really have to work with your fellow cast members and make that connection. Absolutely. And I mean, just just sort of looking through your your past your past filmography and your past work, uh, I, I thought it was so fascinating that that performance of Big River, where you you played the same character as uh, Lyle Canoose, where you were signing, he was he was talking and i'm wondering what that experience specifically not only taught you about you know working with a scene partner but how that how something so intertwined on stage translated to working then in front of the camera well really what i learned was and i remember what you're mentioning so my fellow actor was speaking the line and I signed it. So it was very interesting. Our director, who was Jeff Calhoun, and his vision was, of course, from Huck Finn, right? And it was Huck Finn's perspective and his father, Pap, Pap Huck. And so he was always drunk. He was always drinking. He was angry. He really hated the government and all of that. And so it was the imagining of having a hearing and deaf character. So one is drunk and influencing the other with that inebriation. So it was an interesting vision he had. It was such a fun process. And on the stage, we would tend to transition through the storyline and, and go in chronological order, but on the stage. And so when you're doing 
film or TV, you're not always shooting in order, right? And so you might start shooting the end of the scene or it just depends on your locations. It depends on your scheduling. And it's very important to be prepared as an actor before you get on set to know which, what happens in the scene before or after. And it's important that you understand the story. And that's your responsibility because directors don't have the time to focus on you. They're worried about the sound. They're worried about the set design. They're worried about the costuming. They're worried about the actors. They're worried about the, the vocal the, and the dialogue delivery. And so as an actor, I need to do my homework to make my director have less work and less worries and they can worry about other things. And so that's my responsibility as an actor and that's what I tend to do. Absolutely, and and it's interesting you bring that up because I, I I have I've read some interviews with with, with Sean Hayter, the director writer of Coda, uh, and some things you said that that they're just sort of you know she really understood how to let you be an actor, which you didn't have to worry about any of that other stuff. And I'm wondering I'm wondering what that experiencing that sort of you know it shouldn't be a new thing, but the fact that it wasn't a new thing, how did that inform how f free you felt on set? How did that inform your Performance, how did that inform how you found this character? That is a great question. Thank you, Vinny. So I feel like I had more freedom, especially because we had two ASL masters, Anne and Alexandria. And so Anne and Alexandria were able to watch the monitor behind the camera. And that way I had a sense of relief to have even more freedom as an actor because I know they would give feedback. And so if they weren't there, and they might cut off my signing. They might focus on my hands or cut off my arms because signing and ASL, the grammar is in the facial expressions. And so to have a deaf person there as the ASL master, they could inform the director on the decisions they're, and how they're framing the shot. So of course, I felt so much more free to express myself. You know, I was so happy they were there. It's so important when you have deaf actors to have a system on the set where it's designed to have a deaf eye behind the camera and an ASL interpreter as well. And if you don't have that support as a deaf actor, of course, I would worry about my performance because there's so many hearing people that don't have any experiences regarding deaf culture or American Sign Language. So I wanted to make sure I didn't lose the audience because there's millions of deaf people out there, 40 or 50 million in America alone that can relate and that can be involved with this story. And it's really can benefit the hearing people to get be a fly on the wall and have a new uh, perspective. And so that was all extremely important to me. Absolutely. And something I, I, I had never thought of this, but I, I... And one more thing, sorry oh, okay. not to interrupt you, Vinny, but I asked our director, Sean, to try a few options and she was willing to give me a few options. To, so to, after her vision was satisfied, I wanted to give her a few more options and that gave me more freedom. And so communication, you need to make sure that everyone knows the best way to communicate before you start shooting. Absolutely. I, I'm, I, now I'm kind of curious about that. I, I, I'm glad you interrupted uh, because that's, that's, that's really interesting. I'm wondering if, if there's something that you tried that made it into the finished product that, that was sort of, that was a result of that collaboration. Something that was, that might've been a little different from the way Sean saw it, but something that you brought that, that, that made it to the finished product that, that, that you would think is, it worked better. It worked better because you were, you had that, that freedom because you had that freedom to create. Yes, that is exactly my point. Because we had two pairs of deaf eyes behind the camera, I had more freedom to improv and improvise. And so they could add the lines to the script and give that to our director. And so I was able to add on to what was already written. And so when our director, Sean, asked me, for example, there was a scene, well, the recital at Ruby's school where she's singing. So Sean asked me, hey, Troy, can you try a few different options? And so I just went along with Marley, right? And so we're sitting in the audience and she would improv and I'd play along and back and forth. We'd feed off each other. And then that's what happened. What you see on screen says, hey, what do you want for dinner? And Frank reacts and says, spaghetti. And so that was pure improvisation and that was kept in the final product. And also the buttons not being in the right order on Frank's shirt, that was also improvised because you know, as deaf people were watching all this music sitting in the audience for hours, I'm checking my watch, I'm checking the buttons of, on my shirt as Frank Rossi, I might be plucking my beard and see that there's a little bit of food from last night, some leftovers. 
and I might eat those leftovers that I find in my beard. And they ended up not keeping that uh, leftover in the beard moment, but they kept the others. As they put it, it'll be a deleted scene. Put it on the Blu-ray. I hope so. Exactly. It's it's that that scene. I think that scene is both. It 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 works so well in within this movie because, like you said, that improv is so funny. But it's also it's 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 something that I think like I could admit as an audience member. That's something I've never thought of. As as how how an experience like that is just so different uh, for for someone who who it's just so different from what I would experience. And I'm wondering. You have, you know, you have a daughter, and I, I believe that she's a musician. Uh, I'm, wond I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's something that you were able to bring to this specifically to make it feel just that much more real, which then someone like me watching, it, it kind of is a, it, it hits that much harder because it just feels real in a way that I didn't, I could never experience. Yes, that's absolutely true. Because in the morning, I would drive and pick up my daughter from school or drop her off at school, right? So it was a bit awkward for me to see her carrying her guitar. And she had a, her guitar in a bag, right? And so I'm like, oh yeah, my daughter's playing music and I'm playing it cool. And so I carry my daughter's guitar from time to time and I would check in on her. And out of curiosity, while she was playing the guitar, I'd put my hand on her acoustic guitar to feel the vibrations. And so it's so similar, uh, my experience in real life with my Coda daughter as to what was in the film. And so that is just a fact. Absolutely. And that see, you, you bring that up and that 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 sort of reminds me of the, the scene on the trunk bed with Amelia, which I think is uh, just I think when you years from now, when you mention Coda, that's the scene that people remember. Uh, but what I what I love so much about that scene is you, you touch her neck and there's no you know, there's no obvious explanation to the audience what that means. I think it's something that you just understand. And I'm just, I'm wondering if there's any version of that where anyone said, oh, maybe we should explain what's happening. Or if it was just everyone on set understood that, that this is, this is what, this is what the audience will get from this. Sure. So Frank, there's something in the back of Frank's mind. And so he watches his daughter Ruby's recital and he's, watching the audience's, the hearing audience members' reaction to his daughter's music. And so the audience, the hearing audience are Frank's ears because he's watching how they're reacting to his daughter singing. So he notices that she must be good. And so Frank starts to, it starts running through Frank's mind. And that leads to sitting on the back of the pickup truck with his daughter, Ruby. And he's still thinking about that. And when Frank is sitting next to Ruby, he has the opportunity to ask her, you know, what? why are you so passionate about music, right? That's what he wants to understand. Help me understand what you love so much about music. And so Frank moves closer and he still can't hear her sing, but he's fascinated by how her facial expressions are. They're so different when she's talking in everyday life, but her the expression on her face, she's so much more for lack of a better word, expressive. And so the song that she's singing, he sees how she's emoting in her facial expressions. And he wants to experience this sound that's coming out of her voice. And so he touches her throat and it's not quite enough. And so Frank says, sing it, sing louder so I can feel it. And he's curious, he wants to feel those vibrations. And with it, then he puts two hands on her neck and you see those rippling waves of emotion and Frank closes his eyes. He really wants to completely understand what these sounds mean to his daughter. And when the vibration stops, they make eye contact. And I don't even know how to explain it. It's even hard to explain. It's like a speechless feeling. Frank doesn't have any words, but he is so incredibly proud, but he's frightened because he doesn't know how this will affect his family's business and the sacri sacrifices he'll have to make. He doesn't want to be selfish by keeping his daughter as the mode of communication for his family business, but at the same time, he can't ignore his daughter's talent. He noticed the audience's reaction, so he knows that she has a special gift, so it's tough for Frank 
to make those sacrifices to do what's best for his daughter and what's best for his family. And at that moment, it was extremely powerful. And I'll never forget when that happened. I was looking for the interpreters. They all disappeared because they were both in tears. The CODAs were child, the interpreters were real life CODAs themselves, and they really missed their parents. And our interpreter today, Justin, he's a CODA himself as well. So I'm sure he gets it. Absolutely. And I, I think that that moment of eye contact you mentioned, that that's the whole movie. I think so much of your performance is 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 in that that little bit of that two seconds of eye contact. Yes, I'd love to add that when I read the script, after Ruby sings and she's finished singing, there was a line of dialogue that said, thank you. And I felt a bit, that was a bit off. I wanted a different way to say thank you. So instead, Frank kissed Ruby on the forehead. And so that says thank you without words, without any line of dialogue. And so really, what is communicated between the eyes and that energy and the emotion is just so powerful that it leaves the audience to make their own interpretation. And so that was an extremely special moment and I'm so glad that we caught it. Absolutely, and, and that's, that's the thing about your performance is I think, <laughs> I think the thing that makes it, especially for me, is just in the way that you look at your co-stars. I think there, there's, there's something, you, you tell a story in every scene, a different story in every scene, just by the way you look at your co-stars, whether it's, whether it's uh, Amelia, whether it's Marley. And so I, I think that for all the, you know, the actors who are listening to this, that's that like silence, that is a very underrated part of an actor's toolbox. And I'm wondering if you had to give a, a very short sort of masterclass on the art of just sh showing emotion with your eyes, the, the art of just looking at your co-star, what, what would be your first sort of snippets of advice? It's interesting you say that. So if they're hearing actors, most of them don't tend to make eye contact because as hearing people, you rely so much on your ears. But us deaf people, we communicate visually. That's our only way to listen is through our eyes. And so most hearing actors aren't used to that actually. So it's extremely powerful to have in your toolbox. And so us as deaf people, we have to make eye contact. We have to see your facial expressions. We have to see your emotions and your reactions. And if you're talking behind me, I'm not going to see your emotions and your emotional arc because I can't see what you're saying. And so that's a part of deaf culture, eye contact. And I'm sure many CODAs have experienced that, really traversing these two worlds and how they code shift with their deaf family, they make that eye contact, and then they have to code shift back to the hearing community and they can breathe a bit because hearing people have a bit a different way of communicating. And so you're catching that difference, Vinny, and we have to make eye contact most of the time as deaf people, and then hearing people tend to make less eye contact. Absolutely, I, I mean, I, again, that's just sort of one of the, the wonderful things about this movie is I just, it works as a as a film, but also you know I it so many it, it just opens my eyes to things that I, I it, it's one of those rare films where you watch it and you're like wow I haven't I didn't think about any like any of that like that and you know it, that's it's something to think about I I think a lot of beautiful films came out this year but Coda is the one that you know it it, it kind of changed me as a person I know that's very dramatic to say but you know that's just sort of you know I, that's how I walked away from it. Exactly so. I see a lot of people beginning to shift their perspectives. So a lot of CODAs who I didn't even know who many of them were, and they sent me messages saying, thank you, thank you, Troy. Finally, I feel seen. Finally, I feel understood as a CODA and made so many of them feel good and embrace their identity. And my wife is a teacher. She teaches ASL. She teaches hearing kids ASL. And a lot of them were just taking sign language because they thought it would be easy or fun, and they didn't really do their homework. And then they found out that my wife's husband, me, well, I, that I was nominated. And then all of a sudden they got more serious. They had more respect for her. They started doing their homework and turning it in on time. And so it actually impacted my wife's job. And so it was nice to see that shift immediately, really. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, that's the interesting thing is, you know, this, this is a movie that people need. And so I'm curious, you know, I, I've, read a few, I've read a lot of interviews you've done. 
And you talk about how, you know, as a young man, as a kid who was interested in acting, there just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of representation for you. There, you, there wasn't a lot of things you could grab onto. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, you also mentioned that the first thing that really did draw you in are these old sort of sci-fi action movies. I think you mentioned Godzilla, which I think is very interesting. And I'm curious what it was about that that you sort of first latched onto as, as something that... Oh, it's so funny you, you mentioned Godzilla. You know, I was a naive kid. I just thought, wow, there's a big monster. It's a big lizard. It's destroying all these buildings, you know, back when that was released. Because, of course, the monster didn't have any dialogue. You just saw the physicality yeah. of Godzilla destroying these cities. And so today I'll see it and it's lame, you know. <laughs> it was just like someone in a costume, obviously, destroying these cardboard buildings, right? And so I was so naive as a kid, but it was so fun for me looking back. And so I was so excited when I first saw it. And Star Wars, the first Star Wars film changed my life because it was so visual. There was so much communicated visually. It really motivated me to become an actor. I really wanted to direct, but I knew Hollywood wouldn't be ready for a deaf director. So as an actor on stage, I was able to work with so many different directors and so many different actors. And I was just waiting for the right time and the right opportunity, and I remained persistent. And that led me to where I am now as a nominee. And so I have, of course, the opportunity to possibly go back to directing and go back to that dream when Hollywood is ready. It's really up to them, right? But this is just the beginning. This is a great step forward for me and for my career. I, I, I do, I do want to get to that point, but I, it's very interesting that you mentioned Star Wars because I learned something today uh, that I don't think a lot of people know is that you're, you're now a pivotal part of the Star Wars universe. You, you introduced a sort of ASL to the Star Wars universe through the Mandalorian. I, I, I love, cause I don't think a lot of people know that. I, I didn't know that. And I, I'd love to sort of get your, your view from that, from that experience and, and sort of what that means to you as a, as a person who watched Star Wars as a kid, now you're shaping the Star Wars universe. Yeah, I'm a part of the Star Wars universe. Of course, I'm thrilled to be involved with The Mandalorian. You know, since I was a kid, my dream was to work on something like Star Wars. And so recently I went to, I went to an expo, a fan expo, like a sci-fi sci festival. Uh, it was called Fandom and it was in the city of San Diego. And the group of members there, they're called the 501 Le Legion, the 501 Legion. And so they're Star Wars fans, and they gave me this certificate as an honorary member of their Legion, the 501. And so I was thrilled and honored, and I feel like I'm a part of the Star Wars family now. Absolutely. I, 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 it's, I, this question might be a little, you know, intangible. It might be hard to put into words, but, you, you know, we talk to people... And we want to talk to them about their career, their their the lows, the highs. And I'm I'm just wondering, what does it, what does it feel like to to realize that you're in the middle of of fulfilling a dream? What what does it sort of, does it hit you all at once? Is it something you you ever get used to? Is it ever something you accept, or, or is it does it still does that stubbornness that you mentioned still sort of overpower the the successes? Well, I really noticed that many of my friends who wanted to be actors, they would come to California for a year and then they would leave. And they were hoping that Hollywood would remember them. And I was like, no, you have to stay in California for many reasons. You need to get to know people. You get to become part of the community of Los Angeles, not only in theater, but in TV and film too. And you have to stay for much longer than a year and people get to know you. And I was involved in the theater who had many different reviews. And so a lot of these writers, they knew me ever since I started working in 1994 with Deaf West Theater in LA. And so I got to keep building this network and if there were opportunities to audition, I would do it. But I was still working on the theater stage and I really enjoyed socializing with the deaf community. You know because it's my home, really, American Sign Language. It's where, it's a, my friendly zone, where I can communicate with people. It gave me life. And what really kept my hope alive was Mar Marlton School. Marlton, Marlton School. Oh, sorry. 
what really kept my hope alive, sorry, interpreter error, was Marley Matlin, <laughs> because Marley Matlin was a great representative uh, and the lone representative of the deaf community. And Marley Matlin really kept me, gave me hope. Without her, I might have been too frightened. When I saw Marley really start to emerge in Hollywood, it, I really appreciated it. And that kept my hope alive, seeing Marley. I didn't realize what a long and tough journey it would be for me, but really seeing her really was an inspiration. And so when I would stop doing a production, people then asked me, hey, Troy, do you wanna join this other production? So I kept working because I was responsible, I was committed, I pre appreciated my work, my craft, honing my instrument, and they knew that I was a serious actor and they wanted to keep working with me. So I knew it was better to stay in LA for a little while. I was definitely a small fish in a big pond. And when you're, when you're a big fish in a small pond, then you can kind of move on to a larger pond, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, that's, the, you're, you're someone who's, who came, uh, came from Arizona, went to LA, moved back to Phoenix. You, you've been in all these sort of communities. And I, I, something I, something I've really noticed about Coda is that, you know, there's, there's such a sense of place. You feel like you're in a small Massachusetts fishing town. I'm wondering as an actor, how do you sort of, what do you do to, 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 to get the quirks of, of, of place, of location? Because you're, you're someone who's, who's lived around the country. And what, how do you sort of immerse yourself in a very specific, a, a, a location that has quirks? How do you sort of adorn yourself as an actor with those quirks? Really, it depends on the environment, right? So I would go a bit early and take the time to socialize. So in Gloucester, I would follow around these fishermen. I'd pay attention to their behavior the way, the type of language they used, how they dressed, how they drank beer, how they would get up so early in the morning and they would get off work and they would go to the bar at like 10 o'clock in the morning. That was equal to them having a beer after their night shift at a regular job, right? So I really enjoyed it and, and putting on that heavy fishing clothing really affected me. And I went to all the shops in Gloucester and it was all of these working class clothing, this fisherman clothes and the restaurants and how they serve the food. And in real life, I don't eat seafood, right? So, but I pay attention. And, you know, I'm from Arizona, like you mentioned, and we don't have any whales in Arizona, but they do out there in Massachusetts. Oh my gosh, it was such a change for me. And it's so fun for me to transform into a character. And thanks to our director, Sean Hader, she said, don't cut your beard or cut your hair for five months before the first day of shooting, right? And so I grew out this massive beard and she sent me several photos and videos of real fishermen and what they do on the boat. And I started to think about that and let it all sink in. And when I arrived in Gloucester, it's where I really started to dive into the character of Frank Rossi and socialize and really immerse myself in that community. And at the bar, all these fishermen would actually get in fist fights almost every night. And so the cops would pull up and they were so used to it. They would leave, leave them alone. It was like an everyday thing that was almost normal. And I was just like, wow, I felt like they was just being surrounded by a bunch of Popeyes, uh, you know, being in Gloucester. <laughs> Absolutely. It's part of the culture, I guess. And, uh, you know, that's, I, I, I assume, you know, I, I assume that as an actor, you know, that's something that you, that you just sort of absorb. Is, is there a way for you to, to, to turn that off? Is there a way for you to just, to not always just be plugging in for information to maybe be used later. Might have lost Troy. This is Troy. I apologize. No worries. No, it's the, the perks of doing this uh, remotely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ready. Great. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll ask you one more question just to sort of wrap up. Cause I know, I know this is, this is a pretty whirlwind time for you and the lead up to the Oscars. Um, we've touched a lot on, you know, the, what CODA offers as representation and how it's sort of, you know, it's not the representation you had when you were first starting out. It's not, it's not what, when you were, when you were interested in acting as a, as a kid, it's not what you had. So I'm, I'm curious if you're, how, if you've sat down and thought that, that now you're sort of what you needed to other younger actors. And I'm curious what you would say to both your younger self and to someone who like you is seeing Coda and saying it is possible. It is, this is something that, and there are small changes, small baby steps, but it is happening. Well, 
Well, to my younger self, I would tell young Troy to remain persistent, go to workshops, go to college, be responsible and committed. And of course, the bosses will like you. They'll remember you. They'll want to work with you again. And they'll remember the work you've done in the past. And of course, it's nice to have a backup plan like a college degree or a certificate or a side job. So if something doesn't work out, you have something ready to pay the bills, right? So it's really important to listen. And so if you find your talent, really let it blossom and grow with your skill. Build it up like if you're talented at as a mechanic. So grow that skill as a mechanic. If someone is extremely skilled at science, grow that skill from when you're young and let it blossom. And no one, you're the only one who knows yourself. And so listen to your gut, listen to your instinct and trust it. And so that would be my general advice. And also don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be creative. There's no rules because with today's technology and smartphones, you know, you can make a movie with, you have a movie camera in your pocket when you have a smartphone. So keep that in mind. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm going to cut you loose. I'll let you go. But thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I, I can't stress enough how beautiful I find this film. And uh, we'll be we'll be watching Oscar night. We'll, uh, fingers crossed. Oh, thank you so much. Fingers. My fingers are crossed, too. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening.